Hello, and welcome to a detailed explanation of every civic from the ancient and classical era. The goal here is to help you spend your early game culture by talking about the trade-offs that you'll face and the boosts that you might be able to get. I will be talking about tier one governments and the trade-offs that you'll face there. I don't want to get too far along in the tree. It is a very long tree, so I'm going to cut off at the medieval era. I think this is where most of the really important decisions lie. You know, the first 50 to 100 turns of the game are the most important anyway. If that's something you're interested in, by the way, just let me know. Uh, leave me a comment, and I, I might actually consider expen extending this out, maybe even to like tier two governments and beyond. Speaking of which, if this is valuable to you, please do consider giving me a like and interacting with the video by commenting, sharing with your friends, even subscribing. All of that stuff really, really matters towards growing a brand new channel. All right, with the shameless self plug out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and jump into it with Code of Laws. I recommend that you start every game with Code of Laws, but that's mostly because you have to. However, Discipline is the stronger military card here. I just tend not to run Survey because there are so many more situations where I put Survey in, even though it looks good. I have two or three scouts. I'd like to get them to be mega scouts so I can see beyond forests and stuff. Those are good scouts. But then I look around and I see a barbarian camp and say, oh man, it's an emergency for me to have Discipline slotted in right now. And it's not like discipline doesn't do anything for your scouts because your scouts will run across barbarians and they'll be able to fight if they have the discipline card in. So I just tend to prefer discipline. In terms of economic policies, I will run God King until such time as I get my Pantheon and then I'll go into urban planning. If I have any other source of faith, I will run urban planning instead unless I for some reason need to accelerate my Pantheon. The production in the very early start is much more important than the faith. But if you don't have your Pantheon, the Pantheon is more important than the production. Another reason to go for urban planning over God King is if you have a very aggressive neighbor that's very close by and you need to get your military up or you will basically get crushed before you even can get to craftsmanship. So craftsmanship or foreign trade. Here we are in the very first decision of the civics tree and already I have to tell you that it's an extremely context dependent decision that really speaks to the strong game design of Civ 6 that I can't tell you to go one or the other all the time. So I'm going to tell you about the factors and to why you might make a decision one way or the other. First of all, with craftsmanship, it gives you access to the Agoke card, which is really important for building an early military. So if you feel the pressure is on, you need to defend yourself, go for a Goge. If you'd like to go aggro and beat somebody's face in, go for a Goge, which means craftsmanship. It also gives you access to military tradition a little bit earlier, which can give you those flanking and support bonuses, and also give you the cavalry card once you've researched animal husbandry and connected horses. So overall, the top part of the civics tree is the beat face part of the tree. So why is foreign trade a little bit better? First of all, it allows you to produce a trader, which is a very powerful unit towards building up your economy and also your foreign relations. So you can consider the trader as a way to prevent early war. And early wars can be devastating, especially on deity. But as you can see, it comes at sort of this shields down uh, aspect where you don't have the Agoge card and you've delayed the Agoge card to get this trader. So... It's a really interesting interplay here. You can see that uh, craftsmanship is the more conservative play here. Foreign trade is a little bit more liberal, a little bit more greedy. A couple of reasons. First of all, foreign trade is easier to boost. Discover a second continent, that sort of just happens to you. Whereas improving three tiles, that just doesn't really happen that often in the early game. First of all, you have to build a builder or stumble into one some other way. And second of all, you have to have all of the text that you want for the improvements. Third of all, you have to not spend any of those builder charges on chops. So it's just really unlikely that you'll get the boost for craftsmanship. So if you go for foreign trade, you give yourself more time to get this boost and be a little bit more culture efficient. You can also juggle between them if you don't see a really strong reason to unlock one or the other, just to see if you can give yourself more time to get these boosts. One other slight edge on foreign trade is I consider early empire and mysticism to be better overall than military tradition and state workforce. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I will talk about those in just a moment.
So, rung two of the ladder here. Let's imagine that you've finished either craftsmanship or foreign traits. You're starting to unlock some of these decisions, and you might want to go back and unlock the other rung one of this ladder, but you might want to move forward. Let's talk about why you might want to do those things. To do that, I want to jump forward a little bit and talk about political philosophy, which is the most important opener to the classical era. I would say like seven or eight times out of 10, this is the right opener to the classical era, drama and poetry being the other remaining time. I don't think games and rec is the right way to go practically ever. But political philosophy is extremely important because it unlocks your tier one government. I'll talk about tier one governments a little bit later, but the strong advantage tier one governments have is that they give you more policy cards. So you want to get them as early as possible all else equal, which means we have a strong edge towards the ones in the middle here. So military tradition is not as important. Mysticism is not as important as state workforce and early empire. Let's talk a little bit about why you might get those anyway. Military tradition, I've already said, flanking and support bonuses, extremely important. Mysticism unlocks the oracle which is a really important wonder to build if you're going for a culture victory. So if you're going for a culture victory, you might actually want to delay your political philosophy just to ensure that you actually are able to build the oracle. It is that important. And if you're going that way, you've probably already founded a pantheon by now. This is another one that just sort of happens to you unless you get extremely unlucky. So it's not that hard of a detour. Okay, between state workforce and early empire, I'm going to give a slight edge to early empire. Uh, it's off of foreign trade, which is a better card. It's easier to boost. This boost tends to just happen to you unless your capital doesn't have a very strong growth uh, and your other cities that you've settled don't have very strong growth. Uh, you'll probably have two to three cities by the time that you get the boost for early empire. And it's really hard to miss the boost for early empire. I'd say like 70% of the time you get the boost. And the strong thing here is colonization to get bonus production towards settlers so you can get your other cities down sooner. It also gives you the ability to sell your open borders. So that's actually worth a little bit of gold. And of course, the strong thing about both state workforce and early empire gets you to political philosophy faster, but it also unlocks your governor. Now, why would you want to build state workforce instead? State workforce gives you bonus production towards wonders. So if you're going for, say, the Oracle, you might unlock the Oracle, start building it, wrap back around a craftsmanship and grab Corvée so that you can then chop out the remainder of it with, say, Magnus. It also gives you a governor title, and then it gives you access to building the government plaza, which is a really important district to build because just building it gives you a governor title, and then building the building inside it gives you another governor title. So having the government plaza down and having that second building will really help out if you're going for autocracy, but it also just gives you more governor titles to play around with. Three governor titles is really strong. I would say the colonization card is probably slightly more strong just because getting your, your uh, cities down faster is just really, really good. But again, speaks to the strong game design of Civ that it's a tough choice here. Welcome to the classical era. I've already explained that political philosophy is pretty much the way to go because it unlocks your tier one governments. I will talk about those in just a moment. It also unlocks Apadana, which is a really powerful wonder that I recommend that you build on any difficulty other than deity. On deity, it just takes too long to get there and the AI will probably have it. I don't have experience with emperor or immortal on this actually, so maybe take that with a grain of salt. But anyway, Apadana, good wonder. You should build it. When would you choose drama, drama and poetry instead? First of all, if you're trying to just get these amphitheaters up really quick so you can get your great writer points and get online early, like if you're, say, Russia and you're already getting great writer points from all of your holy sites, it could be really good to go drama and poetry first just to give yourself places to put these great works of writing. Also, if you're going Greece, or sorry, if you are Greece and you have half price theater squares, it might be a good idea to go ahead and get those up and running because they'll also... Uh, help you get to political philosophy faster by just providing you innate culture. If you've already boosted drama and poetry, that of course lowers the opportunity cost of trying to get to political philosophy. If you haven't boosted political philosophy, that also sort of factors into that. 
The other reason you might want to go for drama and poetry first is if you want to go straight into theology. There's one case that I think it's really worth it to delay political philosophy and get into theology, and that is if you are going for a work ethic religion. So in the game, as of recently, uh, I think like May, maybe, they included an update that gave work ethic a new effect that just provided you bonus production equal to the adjacency site of your holy site. So if you have a plus six holy site, you could then double it with the scripture card to get up to plus 12 faith, and then use your religion to turn that from plus 12 faith into plus 12 production, which is very, very good. That's insane for this part of the game. It also unlocks the ability to build the Mahabodhi Temple, which the AI tends to go for around turn 100, turn 110 on Deity. So if you can get that early, that gets you your two diplomatic victory points and two apostles. It's pretty nice to be able to use those apostles to either spread your religion or just evangelize it and get the full benefit of the religion early on. So that would be the case that I would get uh, theology before political philosophy if I have a work ethic religion. Every other time, it's political philosophy. So how do you choose between tier one governments? Well, the primary factor in this decision is the distribution of policy card slots. And that's what gives Classical Republic a slight edge, just in terms of the distribution of the cards that you can run, because you're allowed to run three economic policy cards in Classical Republic. So if you think about the kind of things you might have in the early game, you'd want to run urban planning to get plus one production to all cities, you'd want to run colonization to get plus 50% production towards settlers, and then you could also run something like natural philosophy from the early medieval era to give yourself a big science boost. So just the flexibility of three economic policy cards is really good. One thing to think about is if you're going to be running a military policy card in the wild card slot, you might be better off with autocracy or oligarchy just because the raw boosts to these governments are much better than the classical republic boost. The classical republic boost, just plus one housing and plus one amenity, it's kind of trash. Like, okay, you can delay your granary a little bit if you settle off of water. Uh, it's okay. Like, I, I don't mean to downplay it too much, but I'm not going for Classical Republic to get that plus one housing unless I've settled off of water. And the great person points I don't even really think about because it's too early in the game to really have these plus 15% uh, boosts really matter all that much. So I, I just don't think Classical Republic has strong boosts or um, it doesn't have strong innate effects. Autocracy probably has the strongest innate effect, but let me talk one more minute about this distribution of economic cards. Autocracy, you can run two economic cards, and oligarchy, you can run two. So you don't get your third card, but with the new expansion, there'll be one of the secret societies. So if you're running the secret societies game and you you go for the Owls of Minerva, I think it is, they'll give you plus one economic policy card, which basically invalidates everything that I've just said about Classical Republic, because I don't see you wanting to run four economic policy slots all that often in your tier one government, you'd be better off having at least one military slot. So I would probably go for autocracy in that case. Uh, autocracy is the other good one for peacetime because it gives you plus one to all yields for each government building and palace in a city. This does not count the government plaza district, only the buildings inside the government plaza. So you'll get one plus one innately because you already have the palace built you'll get another plus one if you quickly build your tier one government building immediately after ado adopting autocracy and that's a pretty significant boost to both science and culture faith uh, it really won't matter all that much you either have good faith production or you won't and i don't see plus two faith per turn really making a big difference there and of course the food and the production are worth writing home about as well to help your capital grow so uh, the bonus towards wonders is also like running the corvée card in one of the economic policy slots. So it's like pseudo getting a third economic policy slot as long as you're building wonders. But the main reason to run autocracy is you don't have to run one of the green policy slots. I think they're called social policy slots or diplomatic policy slots. I don't remember. Green is not very good. Uh, it gets better over the course of the game, but... Having the ability to skip it and have two military slots and two economic slots is pretty good because you can run conscription in one slot and then maybe a goge or discipline in the other slot and still have that good economy running for autocracy. So why would you want to run oligarchy? Oligarchy is the defensive government. 
if you're going to get attacked, it's likely that the AI already has Oligarchy and get, is getting this plus 4 combat strength. So if you run Olig Oligarchy yourself, you can catch up. The bonus unit experience is, is nice too. If you're defending, you can just sort of farm some experience. The worst thing about Oligarchy is the distribution of cards. Two economic cards and then one military card is really not enough and the social slot is just not important at all. So Oligarchy is really strong in terms of the, the boost. I, I'd say this is a really strong boost for if you need to defend yourself against aggression. And it's also the strongest in terms of the policy card, the uh, the legacy policy card. Once you build your tier one government, you get a um, legacy card. So when you switch away to your tier two government, you can still run this plus four combat strength. The, the top boost is what you get for the policy card. So that's a really strong thing to be able to just swap in plus four combat strength as a government policy. Uh, so I think Oligarchic Legacy is is definitely the strongest of these uh, legacy cards. Okay, I realize I've glossed over Games and Rec a little bit. That's mostly because Games and Recreation just sucks. I like if you want to build the Coliseum, be my guest, but I really just wait for this one as long as possible. Wind up having to hard build it anyway because I can't get the boost because construction is not a very important tech for my for me either. It is important. The main advantage for games and recreation is defensive tactics, which is a much more important. I would say all else equal, defensive tactics is the best out of these uh, four on this rung here. It gives you a, another governor title, which is good. It unlocks the mausoleum at Alacarnassus, which is basically a wonder you'll always want to build. Like, it's good for practically every uh, victory type. Science and culture are good, just independent. Like, if you're going for domination, science, culture, like, yeah. It's just a really, really good wonder all around. I'm not going to talk too much about it. It also unlocks the Limes card, which is good going to give you bonus production towards defensive buildings, which you can use to defend yourself in an early war. It's kind of in a weird spot, though, because defensive tactics is one of these that you have no control over whether you're going to get this boost or not. You could already have this boost from an early ancient era war that you survived. You could have no idea uh, like whether you're going to go to war or not. You could be imminently going to war but need to build defensive tactics first because you need to get your Lima's card up. So it really is just a, a mixed bag here, uh, whether you can get the boost or not. But it's worth getting into Limes just to build your walls before you actually get attacked. The other really strong thing about defensive tactics is it unlocks feudalism, which is nine times out of ten your medieval opener. Feudalism is insanely good. It gives you the serfdom policy card, which gives you two extra build actions. That's when your economy really starts to pop off. You start getting these uh, five builder charge builders for your cities that have five and six population in them and so you start improving the tiles that it, that those uh, citizens work. You start getting better farms from the farm improvements if you can build farm triangles. So this is when your economy really starts to come online is with the feudalism and the serfdom cards. That's another feather in defensive tactics is cap, especially relative to recorded history. By the way, if you're going for theology early, it's it really should be because you're ready for apostles, you're ready for the Mahabodhi temple to get your diplomatic victory points, or you're going for the work ethic thing. Otherwise, recorded history is probably just better because it gives you a governor title. Um, it is probably easier to build theology or uh, boost theology by founding a religion than to build two campus districts. But you probably, if you're going for a religion game, you probably won't be building two campus districts anyway. I don't know. Recorded history is in this place where it's sometimes like easy, easy to to boost, and sometimes it feels like I should have boosted this thing, but I still have to hard build it. But anyway, the the main advantage to recorded history is it unlocks natural philosophy, which gives you double your district adjacency bonus for campuses. This can be so important as to have you have me delay defensive tactics if I'm going for a science game and I have really really strong campus bonuses. Or even if I'm not going for a science game, if I just have like a plus six campus, like why not get natural philosophy and run it for a while? So recorded history is probably the way to go over theology, but I think defensive tactics is the stronger out of all of these. Another thing about defensive tact, or sorry, um, recorded history and theology is they both line you up into divine right for monarchy, which is the earliest tier two government. And they line you up to get into Reformed Church, which is an uh, sort of upgrade over monarchy. But 
monarchy is not the best tier two government. The best tier two government is Merchant Republic. I don't want to get too far in the tech tree along uh, the medieval era and beyond. I think that's going to do it for this video. Like I said in the beginning, thank you very much for watching. I'm a very new channel, and so all of the uh, likes and comments would really, really help me accelerate my growth. If this is something you really appreciated and you'd like to see more of this content, leave me a comment letting me know what you want me to make. I'm pretty open-minded here. I want to make what my audience wants. So uh, again, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.